and welcome to this edition of EMS Now Up Close. I am Eric Miskell with EMS Now, and it's my pleasure today to be speaking with David Schild. He's the Executive Director for the Printed Circuit Board Association of America, affectionately referred to as PCBAA. Uh, David, it's good to meet you, um, and this seemed like a good opportunity uh, considering the mission of PCBAA. We just had the uh, State of the Union address here last night. Um, in it, the CHIPS Act, the CHIPS and Science Act was mentioned about actually within the first 20 minutes. So seemed like a good time to connect with you and kind of get your impressions and talk about what you heard and what still may need to happen to strengthen the US microelectronics ecosystem. So let's start with kind of what did you hear last night in the State of the Union that you appreciated? Well, th first, Eric, thanks for having me today. I really appreciate the chance mm -hmm. to come on your show and talk about what I think are some important issues for microelectronics and specifically the American PCB industry. You know, the State of the Union for folks like me is sort of the uh, political nerd Oscars. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting at home, I'm taking notes, and uh, to no one's surprise, the president did a sort of victory lap on the Chips and Science Act. And the work that's been done over the last two years to introduce almost $52 billion in government funding and incentives to the semiconductor market. And I thought that that was a remarkable achievement. I think that those of us who are in the microelectronics ecosystem wanna celebrate this because as the president pointed out, uh, a great deal of private money has followed the government investment that has been made and it's gonna train workers, it's going to build factories and most importantly, it's gonna bring home a critical technology set that had largely been offshored. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was struck by the fact that, uh, you know, he spent five or six minutes on this two year, $52 billion story, which mm -hmm. is a lot of time when you're speaking mm -hmm. to uh, every American and all of Congress. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because I, I, I took a few notes last night too. First time ever uh, that I've taken notes during a State of the Union address, but he, he referenced that companies will be investing 300 billion uh, here in the United States. And, and the one that he named, of course, was Intel and what they're doing and bringing 10,000 jobs and what have you. So um, uh, so it, it seemed like a good start. And he said that, and I did write the quote, supply chains for America should begin in America, right? So that's a good message. I, I took the same note. And, you know, he also spent some time pointing out that the lot of this work is to reverse a contraction that's occurred over many decades. You know, he called out the fact that the U.S. used to make 40% of the world's semiconductors, a critical technology we invented mm -hmm. here. Now it's down to 10%. And rightly, many large manufacturers sort of hit the panic button and mm -hmm. went to policymakers and said, there's something that we've got to do. We've got to address this. Now, I represent America's PCB manufacturers and critical mm -hmm. suppliers. And I would say that we've had a similar contraction. You know, in a 25 year period, we went from 30% of global market share produced in America to only 40, or excuse me, 4% today. That's quite a contraction, you know, exceeding what our semiconductor friends went mm -hmm. through. And that doesn't even touch on that other critical part of the ecosystem, uh, substrates advanced packaging, yeah. right? Where still 99% of that work is done overseas. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that the president said repeatedly, and it was a real through line going through his remarks was, let's finish the job. Mm -hmm. And boy, does that resonate with myself? Boy, does that resonate with our industry? Because that's what we think about securing and making more resilient our supply chains. Let's finish the job. Let's make the public investment in not just semiconductors, but in printed circuit boards and substrates as well. Yeah. And especially with the manufacturing, with a lot of the reshoring initiatives going on, coming back, the idea that we need to go to Mostly, you know, China, Southeast Asia for for the, our prints for the, for the fabs is amazing. I had I saw a data point yesterday came from colleagues at iCape who are big you know PCB talking about the PCB market in Q3 of 2022. They sized it at 21.18 billion dollars. So this is a big industry. Just the the PCBA uh, one, the PCB one. Excuse me. Um, so what still needs to happen in your opinion? Well, I think that, you know, when you talk about the size of the industry, the market obviously is tremendous, right? We use a phrase, chips don't float, to emphasize that all of these amazing semiconductors, whether they're made in the United States or overseas, and of course, we're going to have a global balance of, of that production, mm -hmm. they have to be mated with substrates. And of course, 
they have to be made with printed circuit boards, yeah. right? We all know that. There's another number that I would put out there, and that is we had 2,200 companies making printed circuit boards in America in the year 2000. Now we're down to less than 150. So from a political perspective, of course, that means a much lower economic footprint, many fewer Americans actually doing the work in many fewer mm -hmm. states. And so, you know, I, I watched the speech last night and I, I heard about all these new jobs and millions of square foot of mm -hmm. warehouse and factory space that are coming to places like Ohio, Arizona, New York. And I couldn't help but think that we've got the same opportunity with the rest of the technology stack, with the rest of the microelectronics ecosystem, if government policy will get implemented, right? If policymakers will mm -hmm. sort of understand the need to, again, work on the entire ecosystem and not just semiconductors. Right, and in there too, there was the reference to the, what, 10,000 new companies, the startups that had started, but you know, I don't think many of those were PCB fabs, right? I mean, this is not uh, sure. a, a simple industry or, or company or, or, or type of business to, to start and probably not one that's highly attractive for a lot of people. So, so talk to that, talk about what needs to happen. I mean, so sure there's the money, but then there's also the wherewithal, the people willing to do this and to build it, to take that, take the business risk of, of establishing those fabs here. Well, I think you make a great point, Eric, which is there is a business risk right now because the demand signal does not exist. There's so much foreign subsidy going on in the PCB market. Uh, it's what drove us overseas, yeah. right, over a period of two decades. And the president emphasized again last night that private money, private investment mm -hmm. follows public leadership. When the Congress comes in, when the administration comes in and says, we're going to invest $52 billion, we are going to incentivize making high technology that we invented here again <laughs> on our shores here again in america guess what happens right wall street comes to the table private industry comes to the table i think the same case can be made for the rest of the microelectronics ecosystem it can mm -hmm. certainly may be made for pcbs right mm -hmm. um we need a demand signal we need a commercial market that is strong mm -hmm. and you know another thing the president talked about last night was America's critical infrastructure that he wants to improve, and I think we'd all like to see it uh, better, mm -hmm. uh, needs to be made in America. He made that reference several times. And I couldn't help but think about technologies in banking, technologies in mm -hmm. energy, technologies in telecommunications. They're all going to be populated with semiconductors sitting on substrates made into printed circuit boards. We've yeah. taken the first step by investing in semiconductor production now let's send that signal to the business community in the PCB world that mm -hmm. the government is going to act. It is mm -hmm. going to incentivize the purchase of American boards. It is going to provide money for workforce development, for training, mm -hmm. for groundbreaking, for the construction of new facilities. And when that happens, I think you will see a business case emerging on the side for domestic PCB production. And which one is it? And I see if I get this right, uh, the proposed Facilitating American Built Semiconductors Act, right? Isn't that the one that is to give a investment tax credit? So in the last Congress, it was the Supporting American Printed Circuit Boards Act. Okay. Uh, not sure if that name is going to stay exactly as it did before, but it is going to be reintroduced here any day now in the 118th Congress. It's got bipartisan support from Democratic and Republican lawmakers, some key champions from states like Utah and California, and we expect others to sign on. And that bill really has two major components. The first is an allocation of money, similar to the CHIPS Act, that would allow for some of the direct investments by companies that I was talking about. But the second, and I think more important element of this piece of legislation, is a 25% tax credit on the purchase of American-made PCBs. And that would really bring the cost structure into a much more competitive place. And for many OEMs, for many primes, for many manufacturers who are saying, you know, I've got to populate whatever the product might be. It's it's everything from F-150s oh, yeah. to F-35s, right? Yeah. has a PCB inside it. Now I've got an excuse, a reason, a lead to buy American. That's really the most important thing that I think this bill yeah. does. You know, and you touched on it there too. It's one of the mega trends that we see across the globe here, and certainly is that electrification of everything, right? And when you talk electrification, we're talking there's got to, there's a printed circuit board in there somewhere, right? It yeah. may be small, it may be flexible, but it's in there. So uh, we like to say, in addition to chips don't float, that you know PCBs make it possible. 
Uh, there's almost <laughs> nothing, like nothing in the modern world that if you crack it open and look inside, you won't find that again, that whole technology mm -hmm. ecosystem, right? Semiconductors, substrates, printed mm -hmm. circuit boards, and it's not building a resilient supply chain. It's not truly building a more diverse, robust American manufacturing base. If you only take one element, the semiconductor, yeah. and move it back on shore, you've got to do it with every part of that stack, or you're still going to have things going back and forth across the ocean. You're really extending, in many yeah. cases, your supply chains, not making them yeah. shorter. And as the president talked about last night, building here in America what we invented here in America. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's a good point. And even as you're talking about going back and forth from an environmental perspective, that's not good either, right? The, having to, with a focus on that, so so prominent now. Yeah, and I don't think anyone's denying the global nature of commerce. I think what we're saying is yeah. it's not a healthy balance to go from 30% of market share to 4%. In the yeah. same way that the semiconductor community rightly said, we're shrinking, we're contracting, we're introducing a foreign dependency that is gonna hit store shelves, that is gonna hit consumers, that's gonna hit the US military, the yeah. government. We're making that same argument that a diverse and balanced supply chain is really in everyone's mm -hmm. best interests. Yeah. So political will, money, those are those are a good start, but to, let's operationalize this. In order to, to do it, and one of the concerns expressed with, with reestablishing an industry is the is the workforce. The, do sure. we have the talent? Do we have the people? Do we still, after the last 20 years, have the requisite uh, uh, knowledge uh, to do this? What do you say about that? I hear from our members consistently that we face serious workforce challenges, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's uh, computer scientists to signal integrity engineers, there is a shortage of the talented workforce that we need. Everybody acknowledges that. Yeah. What I also observe post CHIPS Act is that many institutions of higher learning, many training programs are again, reading the signals from the government and making their own investments. Now you see at schools like Purdue, Ohio State, Arizona State, right? Very close to where these new mm -hmm. semiconductor facilities yeah. are gonna be built. New undergraduate and graduate programs focused on the design and the production of advanced semiconductors. Mm -hmm. I don't have any doubt that when you break ground on a new PCB facility, when we bring back substrates and critical materials to the United States in much larger numbers than we see today, the educational community is going to go where policymakers lead. It's going to go where the market shows them mm -hmm. that jobs are. This is not gonna be an easy problem to solve. It's gonna require a whole of government and business approach. And of course, it's not just the microelectronics sector that sees yeah. workforce challenges, right? Many right. people in the business community are saying, where is the talent pipeline? Where are we going to find these folks mm -hmm. uh, absent the use of H-1B visas and, and bringing in students from abroad to, yeah. to populate these workforces? But this is high touch, high technology labor. And you're absolutely right. We are going to have to tell, uh, challenge, uh, take on the workforce challenge pretty aggressively once we start the bricks and mortar part of this equation. Yeah, no, 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 that's a good point. Um, what about timing? How do you see this, you know, it's not gonna happen tomorrow, right? This is the sure. beginning. Um, is there a critical window that the US needs to act within in order to realize this? Well, you know, I think that uh, if you look at what the folks in the semiconductor industry did, uh, it's, it's not a short process, right? It took them a number of years to sort of bring together all of the stakeholders who first understand the problem uh, and then secondly, act on it. At PCBAA, we say our mission is to educate, advocate, and legislate. And boy, do we spend a lot of time educating everybody on the ubiquitous nature of printed circuit boards, that they are in fact high technology, and that we depend on them for every aspect of modern life. So our educational mission obviously makes everything else that follows possible advocacy and of course, legislative effectiveness. I think in the 118th Congress, we can make significant progress finding uh, co-sponsors and champions in the House of Representatives, finding uh, champions in the United States Senate, getting the administration, of mm -hmm. course, more well-educated about this issue. Um, and I think that as our team grows, as the PCBAA grows, as we talk to folks like yourself, the word is getting out there that this is possible, right? We do mm -hmm. not have to continue this contraction. Mm -hmm. um, days, weeks, months, and potentially years of work lie ahead of us to get this mm -hmm. done, but it's worth doing. And mm -hmm. as somebody right now is pouring concrete in Ohio to put a semiconductor factory together, let's not create a world where every one of those chips has to 
go to the port of Long Beach and go back across the ocean to be mated up with a substrate or a printed circuit board. Let's truly build a domestic ecosystem that is, again, part of a global marketplace, yeah. but allows us to, as, as the president said, and I like this phrase, you know, build in America what we invented here in America. Yeah, no, and I I thought that was w one of the best endorsements when he said that last night. That, that was very good. Excuse me. So what other considerations are there to make this successful? What is What else is needed? Well, I think that you have to obviously build a coalition when you want to accomplish anything uh, in Washington, D.C. And of course, the issue of bringing microelectronics back touches on a number of key concerns. You obviously have folks who want to see more high-tech manufacturing in America. That's a certain political mm -hmm. constituency. I think you have legitimate national security concerns about where certain critical technologies are sourced and where our supply trains, uh, excuse me, supply chains stretch. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you have other folks that are interested in, you know, um, what the immediate economic impact is going to be in their state, in their district. Mm -hmm. So we take a coalition approach and say that whether your concerns are about the economy or about national security, about workforce development, about just innovation and global leadership mm -hmm. in this space, movement on this idea, on this piece of legislation, uh, it's, it's in your interests, right? And we sort mm -hmm. of tailor our message depending on the audience that we're talking to. But everyone we've spoken to has had, I think, what I would call the right reaction. First, mm -hmm. you know, they have no idea that, you know, when you look at something like this, that yeah. the government's put $52 billion into the chip and it hasn't really put any money or, or any incentive into the rest of the technology package, into the rest of the ecosystem. So we're doing a lot of educating. Eyes are getting big uh, when we have yeah. these conversations. Uh, no, no surprise to anybody there. And, you know, it's not just lawmakers. Uh, you know, it's journalists. You obviously cover these issues and keep people mm -hmm. well informed, but not everybody in the media understands uh, the essential nature of printed circuit boards. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people in the academic community now are writing about sort of the global competition that's occurring in the electronic space. They're getting smarter about PCBs. So we take a surround sound approach. I think that's the only way to do it. Um, and it's a it's a lot of work, you know. I mean, we're playing big league baseball, chasing billions of dollars in Washington. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. Thanks for doing that, by the way. Because, <laughs> and and you're right. You know, I think you know you made me think there. You know, I've been in the EMS industry for gosh sure. twenty years now, in one capacity or the other. And when I tell friends and colleagues that outside of, they say, "What is that?" Right? It's like content, and they say, "What is that?" Right? <laughs> There's this. And I always take out my cell phone. You say, we all have one of these, the people who put these together, right? And in there, but you're right. It's just, even though all these items are so ubiquitous through in our lives, we just don't really have the, the insight in, into what, what goes into putting them together and providing them for us. So I think your point that education is so, so important, I think is, is, is spot on. It's really a foundational technology in modern life. I come yeah. out of the aerospace and defense industry. And mm -hmm. so- you know, what does it take to get the space shuttle into orbit? What does it take to get an F-35 off the ground? What does it take to make sure, you know, a submarine truly runs silent? That's the mm -hmm. world that I come from. Mm -hmm. But of course, you crack open any of those technologies and inside you're going to find this complex interplay of microelectronics, right? I think the people that produce those high technologies know that. Do the consumers know? Do policymakers know? That's what we're here to do. Educate, advocate, legislate. Yeah. No, and that's a very good message. And, uh, you know, I just want to say I really appreciate when I became aware of the PCDA, what they're doing. You know, it's been a, you know, I've been wondering for years why we don't have more fabs in Mexico where so much manufacturing is going, right? It seems like a no brainer that, that, that somebody would invest there. Um, and hopefully they do. And, you know, Mexico, you know, uh, is gaining a lot from the reshoring. It's booming down there. Uh, but those could just as easily come from North, from the United States. Um, I, yeah, I think to your point, you know, friend shoring is, is part of the conversation, mm -hmm. right? Near shoring, as some people call it. Um, we've obviously got, you know, a, a critical dependency and probably an overweight, right, on a certain region of the globe. Yeah. And so rebalancing is really what we're focused on. Nobody argues that 100% of anything is going to be made domestically, yeah. right? Not healthy for the global economy and probably not realistic right. for American manufacturing. Yeah. But to say that, you know, within our lifetimes, right? In the year 2000, we had 30% of the market and it has just sort of fallen off a cliff mm -hmm. uh, in that same time period. Um, you know, critical material suppliers were down to one maker of woven glass in the United States, right? We're down to just a few folks doing copper foil. Um, 
this is not a place anybody wants to be in. And we all learned during the pandemic how fragile supply chains are, mm -hmm. uh, how easy it is to have empty store shelves, uh, empty vehicle parking lots at car dealerships, because there's one critical piece of technology that we really didn't think about, right, before we missed those products. And I don't think we want to revisit those times, right? No. We can have a manufacturing renaissance in America, but we can also introduce, again, a certain element of economic security, uh, national security. It's a win-win story. Now we've just got to convince policymakers, as the president said, to finish the job. Yeah, no, and I think that's good. I think it is a good start, right? I think we're all, it moves it in the right direction. Hopefully the rest of the supply chain will follow. I think you make a very strong argument that, that it will. Um, and like, like, like the president said last night, let's finish the job. And I think uh, th there's a lot to be done. Um, David, thank you for your time and your insights today. This was uh, this is uh, enlightening, I think. And I, by the way, I still love the chips don't float. Uh, that <laughs> captures it, and I've shared it with other colleagues, and they said that that really explains it quite easily, right, in a simple way. And uh, um, so, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights, and hopefully, we we catch up again later this year because this is clearly an issue that that we're all vested in. Eric, I appreciate your leadership on getting the word out on this issue, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, sir.